In this video, I will be analyzing and breaking down the adaptive music and audio design of just two minutes of gameplay from Super Mario Odyssey. First, I will play the clip in its entirety without interruptions to prove that the clip is under two minutes and to give you all a chance to try to spot some instances of adaptive audio design before I break them down. After that, I will go through the clip one piece at a time and explain all the uses of adaptive audio I could find. Before I show the clip, I feel it is important to note that the gameplay I will be showing is my own and was recorded with this analysis in mind, so it's a bit biased because I intentionally do things to show off the sound design. Additionally, I have already 100% of this game, so the world shown isn't exactly what a new player going through the story mode would see. Lastly, I was only able to capture mono audio, but that shouldn't matter too much. Here's the clip. I start in the Sand Kingdom, also known as Tostarena, just outside of the Odyssey, the level's entrance and exit point. Here, if you wait around for long enough, some quiet, ambient desert music will start, which is what we hear on my way down the hill to the town. This is a fun instance of diegetic music and sound effects, something that appears quite frequently in Super Mario Odyssey. Diegetic sound is sound that physically exists in the fictional world, meaning it can be heard by the characters. This explains why the NPCs we saw on the way in were dancing. They can hear the music too. The source of the music we are hearing is the radio on this rooftop. The music pans left and right depending on the camera angle to give the player a sense of direction of this music. As you would expect, the music gets louder as the player gets closer to the audio source and quieter as they get farther away. Additionally, to add to the sense that this music is really coming from that radio, a radio effect was added to the track. Listen to the difference between the music heard in-game versus the track on the OST. Great world building here. Speaking of world building, you may have noticed the coin sound effect got a bit weird as I entered first person mode. This was actually the game simulating the Doppler effect. In this game, the camera is not only our eyes, but also our ears. The camera position is what determines how to pan sounds, how loud to play sounds based on distance, and also the frequency of the sound relative to the camera's speed. This is essentially what the Doppler effect is. 
When I entered first person, the camera moved very quickly towards Mario and therefore the source of the sound as the sound played. This caused the frequency of the sound relative to the camera to increase, resulting in the pitch being higher. This is why we hear things at a higher pitch when we are getting closer to the sound source and at a lower pitch when we are getting further away from the sound source. The sound designers were able to emulate this using the Doppler effect formula. What's cool about this is that we can reverse engineer this equation to figure out that when entering first person mode, the camera zooms in at about 45 miles per hour. Programming in a Doppler effect for several sound effects may seem a bit out of left field for a Mario game. However, this great attention to detail has appeared before in Mario Kart. It's great to see this detail make its way to a traditional Mario game. Now, another filter has been added on top of the radio filter. In most locations, if the player goes underwater, a low-pass filter is put over the music. This effect can be heard all over the game, such as with numerous of this game's mini-captures. From a sound designer's perspective, I think that this is a great touch. However, from a producer's perspective, it pains me to know that someone spent time mixing this track just for it to end up having a filter placed over it. When a player gets close to a radio, Mario will start dancing. Seamlessly, the movements of Mario, the NPC behind him, and various other NPCs around town sync up with both the tempo of the song and each other. It would make sense to think that the animations were made to sync up with the song, but watch what happens when I hit the radio, causing the song to change. Despite the new song being a different tempo, the dancing animations and light sound effects from the NPC's maracas and footsteps still line up with the beat. Furthermore, they transition smoothly. This is possible thanks to two things. One is that both animations have variable speeds and markers that allow them to be slowed down so that the markers can land wherever the devs want. The other is that the game stores tempo information for not just these two songs, but every song in the game. Watch what happens when I change the song using the music player, which was unlocked after beating the game. For starters, the music no longer has a filter or pans, meaning it is no longer being played from the radio. More notably, however, is the fact that not only are both the animations on beat, but the two characters are dancing to different subdivisions, meaning that they each have their own unique system that tells them how to feel the song to best fit their animation based on the tempo of the song that is playing. This gave the developers the ability to put these guys in any kingdom and still know that they will be in time with the music in any and every location. Tracking the tempo allows for some cool effects. But tempo isn't the only thing this game tracks. It also tracks both the key of every song and every important chord change of every song. This allowed them to program sound effects that fit whatever song is currently playing. Listen closely to the notes that play while moving through a spark pylon. The pylon's notes and visual tail changed based on what chord is being played in the music and the song's tempo respectively. Spark pylons aren't the only thing to make use of this song information though. It is also done by tropical wigglers, rocket flowers, and even some footsteps. These sounds can be whatever the game devs want them to be because they're MIDI. Check out how the sound changes to a Kodo when using a pylon in Bowser's Kingdom. <laughs> Tracking song data also allows these sound effects to adapt to song changes on the fly. Notice the chord change between areas as the song changes. It's after the first set of coins and before the second. Did you also notice that there was a low-pass filter that lifted when I exited the spark pylon? Listen again. It didn't happen before, and for a good and thoughtful reason. The first time, I was listening to music through the music player. When music is played from the music player, the filters that come from certain captures and being underwater do not occur. 
This allows the player to listen to the tracks in their full glory, which I think is a great touch. As I mentioned with the track playing from the radio before, it bothered me a bit that the original quality was lost. But this clever system of intentional lack of adaptiveness ensures that players can bypass these effects if they wish and hear the songs clearly. This small, thoughtful detail doesn't make much of a difference in this circumstance, but it was courteous of them to prevent the music from changing whenever you're up high in Metro Kingdom, underwater in Seaside Kingdom, or going through loading zones. Before I get into the amazing 8-bit renditions of tracks that play whenever you enter an 8-bit pipe, let me first demonstrate one of my favorite, least significant parts of Mario Odyssey's adaptive sound design. Listen closely to the difference between the sound of entering the pipe normally versus entering the pipe quickly. Starting in Odyssey, warp pipes make a faster and higher pitched sound when you enter them quickly by rolling or ground pounding in. This effect has since been carried over to the Super Mario 3D World Switch port, and I hope they keep it for future games. Moving on from that, did you hear the smooth transitions from the normal music to the 8-bit rendition and back again? This game has 8-bit segments all over the place, and they all do this. This is because the composers wrote full chiptune versions of the entirety of 17 of the game's songs so that they could play silently in the background of the original songs and transition in when the player enters a 2D area. Lastly, only now do you start hearing the sound effects of the bullet bills. Music notes like these have been around in the Mario franchise ever since Mario Galaxy back in 2007. If you collect one, a bunch more will appear, and if you collect them all, you get a reward. While collecting them in past games, they have played a classic theme from the Mario franchise. In Odyssey, however, they work and sound a bit differently. Listen closely to the sound each note makes. Not only did each note I collected play a note higher than the last, but this puzzle has its own set of note pitches specific to it. If you were to transcribe each note, you would find that the interval between each note is a half step except for the intervals between the 4th and 5th note, the 8th and 9th note, the 12th and 13th note, the 16th and 17th note, and the 19th and 20th note, which are all whole steps. The reason for this is that the notes are grouped in sets of 4, so it makes sense that each set is chromatic, while the next set is chromatic but up a bit higher. Additionally, the last interval is a whole step so that the note sequence ends on C, where it started. Unfortunately, I collected them in a bit of an unusual order, which didn't make this very clear. So here's a clip of me collecting them in a more sensible order. Also, did you notice that the sounds of the notes were all 8-bit? Most of the music notes in this game aren't in 8-bit sections, so they're not 8-bit. Making the notes, blocks, stingers, jumps, coins, and enemies in this section sound 8-bit was a nice touch. Even the sound of taking damage and getting a game over is the same as in Super Mario Bros. Furthermore, if I hadn't already collected the moon, the sound of getting it would be 8-bit too. Also, when the moon spawns, the music ducks for a bit. All that's really left to mention is that exiting the 2D section plays the classic warp pipe noise to help mask the sound of the crossfade between the 8-bit music and the original music. Before I close, I'd like to talk about two little adaptive music easter eggs in this game that both involve the player making the music themselves and are therefore interactive. The first of these is rather well known and was discovered by many players including myself on launch day. By navigating through the pause menu in particular ways, the menu sounds can play some familiar tunes from Mario's past. Listen closely to the sound of quickly opening and then closing the start menu. It's a bit easy to miss, but the melody is the exact same as the sound of obtaining a 1-up. It's fun to know that despite 1-Ups not being in Super Mario Odyssey, the jingle can still be heard. Some players view this little menu trick as a coincidence, 
but the other musical menu easter egg is much more elaborate and surely was no accident. Navigating through the menu like this plays the melody from the Comet Observatory from Super Mario Galaxy. The other easter egg is probably equally known, but is much less exciting on a surface level. If you go to the globe on the Odyssey where you throw Cappy and instead jump on it repeatedly, making it spin, then whatever music is playing will fade out and the globe will start to play music like a music box, utilizing MIDI to change the tempo based on how fast the globe is spinning. The song that plays in the later kingdoms is the game's main theme. But this theme doesn't really appear in game until the Metro Kingdom, just over halfway through the game. So if you're in a kingdom before Metro, it instead plays the song from the game's E3 trailer, credits, and first real kingdom in the game, Cascade Kingdom. This song also plays while climbing the pole on top of the building at the end of Darker Side, the gauntlet at the end of the post-game that houses the last moon. It too is adaptive, and because the song is MIDI, the song has the ability to slow down to a stop like a music box as the player reaches the top of the pole and collects the final moon. Thinking back to my first playthrough of Odyssey, I don't remember the sound design standing out to me all that much. But at the end of the day, is that not the mark of great audio design? Everything just sounds right in this game, like everything sits perfectly in the mix. This is no doubt thanks to all of these adaptive tricks. In Odyssey, the music had control above almost all else. Animations were made to be flexible in order to match the music. Sound effects were tailor-made not to stand out by matching the songs rhythmically and harmonically. Even the music's effects were told when and when not to activate based on the means by which music is being played in the game. In the past, I have heard this sort of perfectly natural mixing called invisible sound design. I think that Mario Odyssey has just that. Although I initially didn't make much note of Odyssey's sound design, critics certainly did. Despite its tough competition in 2017, it was nominated for six awards at the Game of the Year Awards, tying with a few other games for most overall nominations. Among these nominations included awards for both Best Score and Best Sound Design. DICE gave it an award for Outstanding Achievement in Sound Design, and South by Southwest nominated it for several awards as well. Super Mario Odyssey has truly stellar adaptive audio design that works wonders without ever being intrusive. Time to jump